Hi students, welcome to HSC Biology and Module 7, Infectious Disease. This is video number 3 and we're going to talk a little bit about microbes in food and water. Now, One of the important things about this particular area is that it is describing a, a practical investigation. So something that you design and conduct relating to the microbial testing of water or food samples. So let's just provide a little bit of background in this video and then you'll have the opportunity in class to actually work with this. So hopefully by by now you have some understanding of the processes involved in designing valid experiments. You should be able to discuss ways of testing water quality and potentially foods as well and hopefully to um, carry out to design and conduct an experiment that helps you to evaluate the microbial content of food and or water samples through a carefully designed and conducted experiment. So why do we care? Why is this important? Well, there's been quite a history in our understanding of good hygiene practices. So over 3,000 years ago, we can see evidence from both Chinese and Hebrew culture where some aspects of cleanliness in relation to the handling and consumption of food and water were already starting to um, be informed about the nature of infection. So whether there was a direct link or whether there was just an understanding that by uh, observing certain practices that you were uh, minimizing or decreasing your risks of um, becoming ill, that was the start a long time ago in this whole idea of being able to help prevent the spread of uh, pathogens. In Babylonian and Mesopotamian cultures, we saw waterworks that improved the health of the societies, again, between two and 3,000 BC. So uh, long, long history that we have of uh, the use of water, obviously, and also the importance of trying to keep that water clean uh, when it's being used for human use. The Hebrews had a complex series of hygienic laws as part of their religion, and they certainly um, were rituals in relation to cleanliness and washing that were part of um, Israel culture. Chinese had wells but did not isolate them from the use uh, uh, as, as rubbish dumps and of course when that happens we know uh, even in our very modern society there's still a lot of garbage that goes into our stormwater drains, ends up in our oceans, uh, can end up in our rivers and creeks and this sort of thing is uh, has been happening virtually I guess since human culture and so therefore there's also been people who've realized that that's a, not a good idea and how do we um, encourage cleanliness how do we come how do we become more aware of both the environmental impacts that we're going to have and also about ways of minimizing or, or maximizing our own health and minimizing our exposure to potential disease. The Romans had a very complex aqueduct system and sewer works in their cities. And if you visit uh, ancient civilizations like Rome, and, uh, like it, uh, Italy and Greece, you see these fantastic structures, uh, incredibly complex things that were built with fantastic engineering uh, for particular purposes. And that moved, um, particularly in the aqueduct system, moved water around the city. So even though there was no microscopes, there was no ability to see these tiny microscopic disease-causing organisms, many of, we see in many cultures around the world, uh, different rules and practices established by social groups, either as part of their culture or part of their religion, in order to help protect against infectious disease. Some of these practices resulted from observing some cause and effect relationships. And of course, causation and correlation are two important concepts in uh, science, and they're not necessarily uh, related to one another. Uh, but certainly uh, by learning a little bit about the associated incidence of certain uh, conditions and tying them to certain practices, we started to develop an understanding of what might be happening, or at least what sort of things might be present in our food or water. The Chinese could have deduced a connection between water contaminated by feces and gastrointestinal diseases, and it's possible too that the Hebrews may well have made a connection between the symptoms of eating uh, symptoms of infection by tapeworms and eating undercooked pork. And of course, uh, there's certain um, livestock that are just not a part of certain cultures, and maybe um, there are religious reasons why that is the case, but maybe there's also 
underlying that, um, some understanding of the potential um, for transmission of disease. Pathogens are a primary cause of disease, uh, but there are also many secondary factors that facilitate uh, hosts catching an infectious disease. And obviously one of the things that we're interested in in this topic is looking at how pathogens are transmitted from one host to another, and also um, the effect that they might have on the host, but also ways that we can go about trying to minimize the transmission, prevent um, the uh, exposure to pathogens that can cause disease. Heredity can play a, an important part, but cleanliness is one of the keys, and it's something that we've uh, understood a lot more of, especially um, techniques that have developed in relation to surgery uh, were massive, and our uh, discovery of things like antibiotics too, which have all helped us in our battle against pathogens and the diseases that they cause. Because pathogens are so small, we can't see a very large number of them, so we have had to continue to develop practices and good habits to try and minimise or prevent their transmission. So some of the WHO recommendations, and all of these kind of, I guess, are preliminaries to what we want you to do um, with your investigation. The WHO recommends, uh, our World Health Organization recommends the use of safely processed food, so food, food that has been exposed to ionizing radiation that's going to destroy uh, any potential pathogens. The thorough cooking of food, the eating of cooked food immediately. We're really good at reheating meals and we have to be very careful how we store leftovers and also um, how we uh, reheat those. Wanting to ensure that hot foods stay hot and cold foods stay cold is another important thing. Um, and of course, hand washing uh, is something that is not just an important part of food preparation practices, but is something that uh, in the age of COVID that we've continued to uh, do more than ever before. Keeping surfaces clean, um, I'm, I'm sure you, you're aware of the, uh, the, the wipe down of surfaces that we've been doing, particularly around COVID, to try and minimise, again, the number of pathogens that may be on surfaces that could be transmitted from one person to another. And the use of clean water to wash and cook food. And there's still places in the world where you're better off using your own bottled water for cooking rather than using the water that's available. What we want you to do, of course, is we want you to think about um, food and water, the sorts of things that may be present. We want you to design an experiment with the use of agar plates. Agar plates are particularly good for growing two, two different types of cultures, bacterial cultures and also fungal cultures. So where you suspect either may be present in foods or in water, they are the ideal ones. Viruses don't grow in the uh, nutrient agar that we produce. Um, they tend to need cells, so they usually are looking for some sort of a blood agar or something like that, which we don't tend to prepare in schools. Uh, but we will be able to see if we can find evidence of bacterial colonies and also fungal colonies uh, in some of the samples that you look at. So you'll need to think about where you want to take these samples from, how you're going to uh, infect those plates, and also, very importantly, how you're going to make sure that you keep those plates uh, sealed and that any uh, colonies that may grow as a result of your experiment are ones that you're not going to expose yourself to. Good luck in class, and thanks for watching.